Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! This morning, in an exclusive in-depth interview, the last British resident to be held at Guantanamo Bay tells this programme that torture at the US detention facility was a way of life and that some of his abuse at the hands of American guards was witnessed by at least one British intelligence officer who he says did nothing to stop it. Shaka Armour was accused of being an Al-Qaeda operative and a close associate of Osama bin Laden. He tells us that all of the claims against him are lies. The 48-year-old was held for nearly 14 years without charge or trial. Initially at Bagram, a U.S. airbase near the Afghan capital, he was later transferred to Guantanamo Bay on Valentine's Day 2002. Speaking to Victoria just weeks after he was released from American custody on the 30th of October, he tells us how it felt to be reunited with his family, including a son who he had never met before. How a U.S. guard threatened to rape his then five-year-old daughter how British intelligence officers witnessed his head being slammed repeatedly against a wall whilst he was being held at Kandahar Air Base in Afghanistan in a technique called walling. How he made friends with ants in Guantanamo Bay to get through his periods in solitary confinement. How he has no idea how he survived, but he always knew he would be released one day. And that he would be prepared to return to Guantanamo Bay if that helped to close the detention facility. We'll play you the first part of our exclusive interview in just a moment, but first, our reporter Jim Reed has his story. He was the last British resident left in Guantanamo Bay and one of the most controversial inmates, with so many questions about his case still unanswered 14 years after he was first detained. Shaka Amma is now 48 years old, born in Medina in Saudi Arabia in 1966. In his 20s, he moved to the United States, even working as a translator for US personnel in the first Gulf War. He came to the UK in 1991, met his British wife and had four children, the youngest he has only just met for the first time. In 2001, he took his family to Afghanistan. He claims for humanitarian work. The US claims he was an Al-Qaeda operative and a close associate of Osama bin Laden. In late 2001, he was picked up by bounty hunters looking for foreign fighters and sold to the US. He was taken to Bagram Air Base near the Afghan capital, Kabul. It was there his story gets even more murky. Mr. Amma alleges he was tortured, beaten and strung up while being interrogated at Bagram. And he says that treatment was witnessed by British intelligence officers. At one point, he claims he was held at Bagram with another man, Ibn Sheikh al-Libi, and witnessed his torture. No photos exist of the Libyan who is now dead. But it was al-Libi who is alleged to have told US investigators that Saddam Hussein trained al-Qaeda terrorists. That information, which turned out to be false, was used to help justify the invasion of Iraq. Oh, the reason I keep insisting that uh, there was a relationship between Iraq and Saddam and al-Qaeda because there was a relationship between Iraq and al-Qaeda. At one point in his detention, Mr. Amr claims he made a false confession to end what he says was torture. So on Valentine's Day 2002, the US military flew him to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Through his time there, he says he was beaten, subjected to sleep deprivation and held in solitary confinement for long periods. He was repeatedly on hunger strike. Two years ago, a US news program was broadcasting from inside the camp when he began shouting from his cell. Act with us like a human being, not like slaves. You cannot walk, not even half a meter without being chained. Is that a human being? That's a treatment of an animal. In 2007, he was cleared for release by George W. Bush. Despite a formal request by then Foreign Secretary David Miliband, American authorities refused to let him go. 
The same thing happened again in 2009. He was never charged or put on trial. But campaigners worked hard for his release. British politicians spoke up on his behalf. He was flown out of Guantanamo on this Gulfstream jet and six weeks ago landed back on British soil where he is now being treated as a free man. Throughout the programme, we're going to play you different parts of Victoria's exclusive interview with Shaka Ama. There is some graphic description as he talks about his alleged abuse. You can watch the full interview on our programme page, bbc.co.uk slash Victoria. We'll start with Shaka Ama describing how it felt to arrive back on UK soil for the first time in nearly 14 years. At the very beginning of the interview, Mr Ama recites an Islamic prayer which he asks Allah to guide him through the interview. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Amma ba'd. Knowing that I'm coming back to my family, it was truly hard, hard to believe, sitting in that aeroplane, thinking that definitely I'm going back, thinking how I'm going to face it thinking how I'm going to be with the kids. And seeing your wife and your children, including your youngest, who was born on the day that you were transferred to Guantanamo Bay, give us an insight into that moment. Because I know, I know I'm just going to fall down and start crying. So I said it's the best thing just to do it with my wives because she's going to guide me through the whole thing. I know she needed help herself. So I thought, let me just see her herself by herself. You know, let her be comfortable back again with me, knowing, you know, what happened and how it happened. And I want to assure her that I did not neglect her. I didn't just let her go. What were your first words to her? <laughs> I'm back. What were her first words to you? <laughs> she was just crying, that's all. She was crying and then I started crying, that's all. And then your children? Tell us about that. It was hard. It was hard. It was really hard. I need to know who they are. I need to understand how they think, how they do things, what they feel about me. What was her advice to you then before you met, before you saw your children and met your youngest son for the first time? The first thing she said, they love you so much and they've been fighting for your release so much. And uh, she just told me, you know, just, you know, try to just relax and try to just you know, just be you, and they will assure you they will love you. But I'm still, I'm scared, you know. I'm a father who, who did not practice his fatherhood for 14 years. So, and I left them when they were little tiny kids, you know, hugging them, carrying them all the time. Even though it was a happy moment, but it was sad in the same time. Because it was happy that I've seen my kids again. But it was so sad that the feeling is not that uh, my kids, you know, they look at me and they're just trying to know who is this person, you know. I don't know, but through their eyes, I mean, I feel like they're just looking at a stranger, you know. Did they, did they run to you? Did they nah, hug you? No, not at all. Even though it's sad to say that, but I mean, they're teenagers, you know, mm. they were just stood there, you know. What did you I say? I was the one who was running to them, you know. You ran to them? Yeah, and hugged them and cried. and. They were just standing there still. But uh, I said, thank God now it's, things changed, even though it's been a month and a little bit more, but, but things change a little bit and mm -hmm. they start to realize that, you know, their dad loves them so much and he's trying to do everything to comfort them, to, to be there for them. And they're coming along little by little. How did you, can I ask, how did you introduce yourself to the son you have never seen your youngest? You know, I've been asking myself when I was in Guantanamo every day, you know, how I'm going to do it, what I'm going to do with it, how I'm going to make him, you know, understand that, you know. I love him as much as I love the others and, you know, it wasn't my fault. But the first thing is I start talking to them and I told them, you know, I want you to understand that I did not leave you. We were separated. We were forcefully separated. And I don't want you to blame me or blame your mother of what happened because truly it was, you know, we were victims of circumstances. 
and uh, I still hope they understand that. What is it that you're enjoying most about freedom now? Freedom is so, <laughs> just to feel that you are free. Just to wake up and know that nobody is going to tell you what to do or how to do it. And just to wake up without knowing that you're going to be shackled in every step you take out of that cell. And I lost my freedom for 14 years. I'm going to go back to 2001, if that's okay with you. After living in London and marrying a British woman, you decided to move to Afghanistan in the summer of 2001 with your wife, who was pregnant, I think, and your three young children. You moved to Kabul. Why? I lived in this place for five years before I went to Afghanistan. Four years out of the five years, I was homeless. You know, in the same time, the way my wife appear, you know, wearing a full niqab, the way I am, wearing an Islamic dress, walking around, obviously you can see this guy is, you know, a very practicing Muslim. It was hard. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was hard. Because people talk and say rubbish things about you, about your wife. Eyes chasing you everywhere you go. Why did you move to Kabul? I want to be with people like I feel like I'm, I belong to. But under the Taliban? You know, uh, under, under the Taliban at that time, I think it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't that horrible. We were always led to understand you moved to Afghanistan at that time to work for a charity. Is that not accurate? And it wasn't an official charity as, as documented. It's a charity that they're doing that. And no, it was, it was our own way of helping that society. Then 9-11 happened. Um, sometime before Christmas, you were captured by the Northern Alliance, which is a group of fighters who were anti the Taliban, and you say they tortured you. Can you tell us about the kind of torture you received at their hands? Well, I wasn't captured, really, because putting it captured that I was in a battlefield fighting, and uh, somehow they captured me there. But that's not the reality about most of people in Guantanamo. And this is very important for you to understand. There was no capturing, there was no fighting, actual fighting with a lot of people. It was, it was a business, it was, it was a business. We got sold many times. And in the hands of the Northern Alliance, what did they do to you? For a whole two weeks, all what they've been doing is just take you outside and beat you with cables, with sticks, with and just accuse you of killing their leaders. They didn't even ask questions. They didn't want to know nothing. It's just a total revenge, you know. You killed our leader and we're going to kill you all. And uh, truly, I didn't understand what, what should I say to them to let them understand. I just got here. I've been here only two months, you know. But in the end, I find out that they just want me to say one thing and they will let me go. What was the one thing? They said I, I, I did work with Bin Laden and, you know, I'm with the Qaeda. And, and you said it? And I said it, definitely, and it was filmed. Why did you say it? Because, because of the torture. Was no, it true? No, it, it, no it, definitely it's not true. And you know, I wish I can found that film again. Two days later, you were in American custody. You were taken to Bagram Airfield. And I think initially, you expected the Americans to treat you well. Yes. As soon as you arrived, you say, abuse by US soldiers began. For example, you were taken to a concrete room and ordered to remove your clothes. Yes. They ordered to, to strip naked in front of a oh, lot of men and women and soldiers. And it was shocking for me. It was shocking me. But actually, they were doing it for the sake of humiliation so for the sake of breaking me. Alongside humiliation, you say there was beating, and in particular, something called walling. Tell us about that. That's when somebody grabbed my head and just smacking it to the wall behind me, just back and forth. And all what I'm trying to do is resist, you know, hitting back, but I was in shackled, and all what happened is just my head smacking the wall behind me, smacking the wall, back and forth, back and forth. And then suddenly my head is just down. And I'm just my eyes is closed and I'm just, you know, thinking what's going on, you know, because all that, my vision, I'm sure, is I can't even see what's going on because everything is, in my mind is just running around. And as soon as I open my eyes, there is nobody in the room. Everybody's out. 
at the moment of impact. This is just pain, pain after pain. I just, you know, and all what I'm trying to do is protect my head, you know, I'm trying to pull back. And all what I feel, boom, back again, you know. It's not like, it's not like you can even think about it. It's, you know, it's all what you, all what you, I think all what you can think about is how to save your head from blowing up. And they sat me down the, the, the wall behind me. And they start talking to me, all of them at the same time. One guy with a French accent, one guy with an English accent, another guy with a Russian accent, and then two guys, which is the one who have my case, the American, one of them is called, his, he called himself Tony, and the other one is John, and some other people sitting, and they just asking questions. They don't even want to wait for that answer. They don't want to even know the answer. And I was like, why are they asking if they don't want to hear the answer? Getting in touch on this uh, tweet from Stephen, disgrace that a man can spend 14 years in jail without trial. Jackie has tweeted to say spending 14 years jailed without charge or trial is totally unacceptable on any occasion. Jerry on Facebook, poor guy has been to hell and back and for UK military personnel not to help is beyond contempt. And Daniel on Facebook asks, what humanitarian work? Who did he register with? Where is his proof? You've been talking to us this morning about our interview with Shaka Ama. John has tweeted to say the Americans should be deeply ashamed of Guantanamo, a dark blot on their history. I really hope the UK was not complicit too. Nigel has texted it would help us to make an informed decision about Shaka if he would explain what he was doing in Afghanistan in the middle of a war zone and why he moved his family to the middle of a war zone and an anonymous uh, person via Twitter, he does not need to prove his innocence. Surely the onus is on the Americans to prove his guilt, which obviously they could not do. We uh, love hearing from you. Do keep your texts and uh, emails coming in. Texts will be charged at the standard network rate, don't forget. And you can watch the programme online wherever you are, via the BBC News app or on the website bbc.co.uk forward slash Victoria. You can also subscribe to all our features on the News app by going to Add Topics and searching Victoria Derbyshire. Shaka Ama was held at Guantanamo Bay for 5,008 days without charge or trial. The British resident was accused by the US of being an Al-Qaeda operative who posed a high risk. Claims he has consistently denied. He is now a free man, having been released just over a month ago. This morning, in an exclusive in-depth interview, he tells this program that torture at the US detention facility was a way of life and that some of his abuse at the hands of American guards was witnessed by a British intelligence officer who did nothing to stop it, he says. Speaking to Victoria, he tells us how US guards threatened to rape his then five-year-old daughter. He compares his time at Guantanamo Bay to Harry Potter's The Prisoner of Azkaban. That he had attended talks in London given by the Jordanian Abu Qatada, a radical preacher who, as years went by, became increasingly extreme. He saw one detainee being taken away from Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan alive in a coffin. This is significant because that detainee, Im Sheikh Alibi, is alleged to have given false evidence under torture of a link between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda, which led to the Iraq War. He says he has no plans to take legal action against the British government over the abuse against him that intelligence officers allegedly witnessed. Well, you can watch the full interview on our programme page, bbc.co.uk forward slash Victoria. Over the course of this programme, we're playing you three parts of that exclusive, wide-ranging interview. Some of his descriptions of his alleged treatment are graphic. In this part, Shaka Arma described, well in our first part, sorry, he described how he was initially held at Bagram Air Base near the Afghanistan capital, Kabul, before being transferred to Guantanamo Bay. In that, he described how his head was repeatedly banged against the wall by US guards, he says, in front of a British intelligence officer. Are you adamant that there was an English officer, intelligence officer, agent in that room when your head was being beaten against that wall? I have no doubt he's an Englishman because the way he spoke, the way he's very careful, the way he was sitting far away looking at me, you know, and because the day before I met John who, who already told me I'm, I'm with the MI5 intelligence service and I came to ask you a few questions. So I have no doubt 
he was an English man. Did this English intelligence officer take part in the violence against you? No. Did he make any attempt to stop what was happening to no. you? No. Could he have done? Yes. Indeed, they, they can. If, if what you have said is true, then he was complicit. Or maybe he's unable to do anything because I hear it from others, not from him, not from John himself, but I hear it from others that, listen, this is all totally Americans. But you just said he could have intervened. Yeah, he could. What else would British agents be aware of in terms of your treatment at Bagram? Everything. I think they know everything. So the way you were held, the fact that you were in cages, the freezing temperatures, the water being thrown upon you, the isolated, humiliation, isolated by the myself. violence. Because one thing about me that I've been isolated from the first day I arrived, I was by myself in a cage, by myself all the time, and most of the time standing up, 18 hours a day. 16, 18 hours a day, every day awake, and every day standing up, sometimes with my hands out, and you cannot miss me. So British intelligence officers would have seen you? Definitely, they have to see me. They can't, they can't, they can't not to see me. So do you believe then the British, the then British government knew that people like you were allegedly being treated like Honestly, that? Honestly, I don't want to say government here. What would you say? Because I don't think it's really something to do with the government as much I think it's the intelligence service, which is totally, for me, different than government. After the walling, um, my understanding is the room was left empty and you were told to tell the truth or you would die and a gun was left on a table in front of you. Yes. What, what did you think telling the truth meant and what was the gun for, do you think? Either. I'm going to grab the gun and try to kill myself or either they want me to touch the gun and then they got strict order by the guards that to shoot me because he's trying to, you know, do something to the guards or try to harm somebody. And I was just keeping my eyes on the gun, just looking at it and thinking, I said, no, I'm not going to even, you know, touch that gun. I'm not going to even do nothing because regardless, you know, just ignore it, just think it's not there. Even though inside, from inside the temptation is great, you know. Just end it up, you know. Just end yourself here because this is it. But I resisted that feeling. I resisted that, hey, neither because I'm, I will never harm anybody. And truly, I can't. And did they say to you, tell the truth? Yeah, but, you will die. But, but the whole thing is I told them the truth. But the truth that I've been telling them is not the truth they want to hear. So right? what do you think they wanted you to say? What so did that they want he's, you to say? He's, he's with Bin Laden. He's, because I believe that video that has been filmed, that I said I'm with Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. And you, you signed a statement too, saying you worked no, with Bin Laden? No, I didn't. That's, some, that's another lie. I never signed anything from the day I was kidnapped until the day I left Guantanamo. I did not sign a single paper. At Bagram 2, a Libyan man called Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi was held there at the same time as you. One of your lawyers, Clive Stafford-Smith, says you witnessed al-Sheikh al-Libi being taken out of Bagram alive in a coffin. Is that correct? Yes, it is correct. But I want you to understand that truly the whole thing about Ibn Sheikh al Libi and the circumstances around this issue is a very critical now at this time. And there is a lot of things I cannot talk about yet until you know, I know exactly the effect of what I've seen and you know, what I witness is, 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 is not going to jeopardize my security and my safety in this place. So let's leave it to another time. Would you like to see the then Prime Minister Tony Blair, the then Foreign Secretary Jack Straw held to account for what you say happened to you at that time? The only thing I really would like to happen is for Tony Blair and for whoever in the government at that time is to tell the truth, just like I'm telling the truth to the world. Do you believe Tony Blair knew what was going on at Bagram at that time? Oh, definitely. Definitely. They know, all of them, they know what they were doing. Because, I mean, if these guys are the head of the state, they don't know who's supposed to know. After Bagram, you were moved to Kandahar mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Did the same treatment continue? 
Actually, it's worse. It's a lot worse. Uh, In what way? Uh, first of all, when I get to Kandahar, they have a, something called welcoming party, where they, they really beat you up. These are U.S. soldiers? Yes, just beating up, beating up with the M16, jumping on your back, you know, kick your head with their boots and all that. Plus, I spoke good English, which has made it horrible on me because there was a guy laying next, next to me and they were doing horrible things to him with the M16. What? Can I ask it's, what? It's, you know, they're trying to shove the M16 behind in his backside. And the guy is screaming, he said, I'm not a woman, I'm not a woman, why are you doing this to me? Why are you trying to do this? And I, it, was, it was so sad, it was, it was so upsetting. And I wasn't laying down and, and then I said, you know, I have to do something, you know. So I sp started speaking in English. I said, guys, please, you know, you know, this guy is saying this to you, this guy. And as soon as they heard me speaking in American accent, English, straight away they all left what they have in their hand and they just came back to me. And they start shouting, he's a traitor, he's a traitor. And I just had it, left and right, left and right. And they did it for two, three hours. And truly, truly, that's one of the times where I felt like I, I'm not going to live that night. I'm not going to survive that night. I was just, you know, saying, you know, mentioning my God, you know, praying that, you know, this is my last, you know, minutes, that's it, you know. How did you survive? I don't know. I don't know. Truly, I don't know. I promise you, I don't know, but I survived it somehow. There were threats against your family um, during that time. Uh, one particular interrogator, I understand, threatened to sexually assault your then five-year-old daughter. Yeah, actually, and that was the hardest thing. That the hard, that's, that's, the, that's the hardest thing that I ever heard. What did he say? I think it's the worst experience ever I lived in my life at that time, because I was in a tent for 10 days, starving, no water, no nothing. And he would be so horrible. And that's one of the time when he told me that, that your wife and your daughter is with us. And you know, if you don't start talking, we will rape your daughter. And you will hear her crying, daddy, daddy. That was, that was completely, you know, inhumane. It was worse than the beating as well, worse than everything. Just thinking of my daughter, you know. And I just sat there, you know, silent completely. And three, four days I didn't say a word. Then he came back again and he tried to be Mr. Nice. And he started to come again and say, hey, you know, we're trying to help you here. So you don't know how to feel, you don't know <coughs> anything, you know. You don't know, you, you want to hate him or you want to love him or you want to you wanna kill him. But I felt that time is that it will never end, you know. I will die before it ends. And really I felt like I was going to die before this is going to end. Did you genuinely believe that they had your wife and daughter in custody? Yes, yes. Because I genuinely believe that I didn't even know at the time when I separated from my wife, she's safe or she's in that house or she got sold. So anything could have been. She could have been anywhere. She could have been sold to the American just like I got sold. And, and I just shut down. I didn't speak to anybody after that for three, four days. At Kandahar were British intelligence officers there too? Yes. What did they witness? I think they know what's happening. And did he witness the treatment you say you got he to saw me. He saw me on the floor, on the dust. On he saw how miserable I'm living. Did how he take part in any... No. I don't... Mistreatment of you? No, nothing at all. I'd like to read to you a list of claims that the US made against you, all of which come from the official US Department of Defense file uh, from November 2007, which concluded, as you know, that you were high risk, as you were likely to pose a threat to the US, its interest, interests and its allies. None of the allegation is true, they've been saying about me. You were an Al-Qaeda operative, they said. N not at all. Prove yeah. it. All what I say, prove it. Prove anything that you said that is true, prove it. Prove it to the world. You held a senior position in a UK-based Al-Qaeda cell. Again, allegations. You were a close associate of Osama bin Laden. Wow. Keep going. When? How? 
Where is the where is the evidence? You know, where is the British intelligence at that time? Five years I've been living in this country. How come an operative for Bin Laden working in London and they didn't even know about it? You never communicated with him? At all. You never met him? Definitely. And if, if the British say, well, say otherwise, so why didn't you give it to the American to prove that I was communicating with him? Another accusation, you were an Al-Qaeda recruiter, financier, facilitator with a history of participating in jihadist combat. Definitely no, but it's a joke. You received advanced terrorist training, indicated your willingness to become a martyr and served as a sub-commander of Al-Qaeda forces in the mountains of Tora Bora in Afghanistan. I have never been trained, neither have I never been in any camps. That while you were in Bosnia in the mid-90s, you met Baba Ahmed, who was later sentenced to 12 years in the US for being behind a website which supported terrorism. In fact, I was with Baba Ahmed yesterday, last night. I see him for after 15 years. And I will tell you one thing. Yes, I met him in Bosnia. But we all doing what everybody was proud to do at that time, is help the Bosnian people. And I did help them. Did you fight in Bosnia in the mid-90s? No, I didn't. That whilst living in Brixton in London, you lived with Zacharias Musawi, the only terrorist to be convicted for his part in 9-11. I never lived in Brixton anyway. Did you and live I, with the Zacharias Musawi? No, no, I didn't. But you knew him? Truly, it could be because I meet a lot of people in Brixton most, but it does not make me the bad guy. You know, it's what I did. It's not whom I know. The file goes on to say you had links to well-known British jihadis like the Jordanian cleric Abu Qatada, like Abu Hamza, former imam at the Finsbury Park Mosque in London. I don't know Abu Hamza truly, and I will be lying if I say I know him. You know, I know of him because he was in the mosque. Abu Qatada, I used to pray in his place. I used to sit and listen to his speeches. And I know he's not a bad guy. That's exactly what I know. I know he's not a bad guy and he's not somebody horrible as they say he is. Described by a Spanish, Spanish judge as Osama bin Laden's right-hand man in Europe. I don't know about that. But according to my own knowledge, he got nothing to do with bin Laden and he never, he never breached about him in his circles and he never encouraged anybody to go to Afghanistan. And one final one from that def Department of Defense file. You admitted, it says, that you associated with the convicted shoe bomber Richard Reed. Lies. By Allah, I don't even know who's Richard Reed. He attempted to put explosives in his shoe and get on a Yeah, but I, a don't, plane. Know, I don't know anything about him or, or who is he. This Department of Defense file containing those accusations against you came out in November 2007. That was several months after you'd been cleared for release by the Bush administration. Amazing, isn't it? So what do you think was going on? It's amazing. I mean, it's, I just leave the audience to think about it. I mean, these allegations came after they cleared me, you know. And yet, what did they find out? That after they cleared me, they found that out? So what do, you, what do you think was going on there? Because of the amount of the knowledge I have. Because the more I talk, which is I'm a talker, a man who will never keep anything secret, I speak my heart and I don't, I'm not scared truly to say everything I know. And the more they knew what I know, the more they got scared. And I can't even tell the world exactly everything they did because it's scary sometimes. It is scary. After 14 years, I know they can fabricate anything. They can, they can do something to harm me. They can intimidate me. They can do a lot of things. You're talking about a government here. You're not talking about individual. And it's a scary thought to be back again to jail or back again to the horrible situation I've been in before. Well, on the specific claim that a British intelligence officer witnessed Shaka Amma's alleged abuse, both MI5 and MI6 have a policy of neither confirming nor denying claims. A spokesperson for the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, says Tony Blair has always been opposed to the use of torture, has always said so publicly and privately, has never condoned its use and thinks it is totally unacceptable. Now, this morning's programme has been dominated by our exclusive interview with Shaka Ama, the last British resident to have left Guantanamo Bay. 
in our wide-ranging interview. He tells Victoria what it was like to be held without charge or, or trial for nearly 14 years. The US claimed he was an Al-Qaeda operative. His lawyers say the case against him came from unreliable allegations extracted during torture and that his treatment at the US military base in Cuba raises serious questions about the legality and morality of the so-called war on terror. Earlier, you heard the 48-year-old describe alleged brutality against him whilst he was being held at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. Brutality, he says, was witnessed by at least one British intelligence officer who he says did nothing, nothing to stop it. In this final part of the interview, he tells us about his detention at Guantanamo Bay where he was kept in solitary confinement for long periods and repeatedly went on hunger strike. He also confirms for the first time that he will not be taking legal action against the British government. There is some graphic description in his answers. On Valentine's Day in 2002, you were transferred to Guantanamo Bay. You didn't know it at the time. It was the day your youngest son was born. Did you have any idea of what to expect at Guantanamo Bay? I just have a general idea, but I was shocked. The first day I was shocked. The, not the first day, the first second I arrived, because the first thing they tell you when they drag you, they don't even allow you to walk. They drag you on your feet. They just drag you, pulling you, and your, your feet hit the stairs and all that, and they just on the bus, and they said, this is the end. This is the end of your life. You will never leave this place again. And then they tie you to the bus in the ground with the chain in your hand. They tie you with your legs. And then they start hitting you left and right. Even though it was in that dark time, in that dark moment of getting beaten up left and right, then I realized, I realized it's not what they told us in, back in Kandahar, that Guantanamo will be okay. How would you describe it? You know, the closest thing for my mind, you know, is, is a Harry Potter story, you know, because I read it. You know, they got, they got an island in Harry Potter, it says Azbakan, where there's no happiness. They, 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 you know, they just suck all your feelings out of you. And you don't, you don't have no feeling anymore. And truly, that's how I felt all the time, is this is Azbakan, this is not from this world, you know, because that's what they tried, you know. They want to make you feelingless. They want to deprive you from everything, anything. Even this feeling of belonging to something or the, you know, um, this is my cell. You can't even say this is my cell. You can't. Because they keep making you do things inside the cell that against your will. In terms of the kind of interrogation you received at Guantanamo Bay, can you describe that for us? They're not looking for answers, you know. They're just looking to blame you on something, regardless if you are telling the truth or not. How did these interrogations at Guantanamo differ to what happened to you, you say, at Bagram and Kandahar? In, in Guantanamo, they were more careful. It's more discreet. It's more, you know, all the method of the torture in Guantanamo is totally has a, like I told you, like a cover up for it. So they can practice all this torture, they practice all this humiliation because themselves, they feel like you know, like we are the people who done it, so let's just take revenge. You said in a Met statement in 2013 that you were visited three times in Guantanamo Bay by British intelligence officers. Yes. Were they involved while the interrogations were going on? No. What did they see of the way you were treated? They just know about it. As I told you last time, just about the guy whose name is John, and truly, he told me, I know what they are doing to you. We know. But I promise you one thing. When you come back to England, you will know we are not like them. Which has made me feel so good. It made me feel so happy. And that was the first time, you know, somebody really, I felt he's sympathizing with me. Because the other two times, they were just coming to interrogate me. You have described torture as a way of life, 24-7 at Guantanamo yes, Bay, yes. a world of mental and physical destruction. Indeed. Explain to our audience what forced cell extraction involved. The whole program in Guantanamo is being designed by psychologists, by people they know how to manipulate you, how to make you get scared. So the guard come and ask you for very little thing, like a pack of salt that he didn't find in the meal, where is the pack of salt? You're not supposed to keep it. And maybe you didn't even have the pack of salt. He said, give me the pack of salt. He said, I don't have it. 
And then, like I told you, they start coming. There is like six guards. And you will find yourself 15, 17 people coming towards you while all these guards from the beginning of the tier of the block marching with big, you know, heavy steps. Doof, doof, doof. And you'll be waiting, oh my God, you know, and everybody's shouting, they are coming. And then they come in front of the door and they start shouting, you know, go down, put your face down on the floor, you know, put your hands behind you, things like that. Because your head has to be end up in the toilet, which is another humiliation. You have to stick your heads with your own self on the toilet just to let them in. And we refuse to do that. So you will be saying, hey, I'm sitting on the bed. They won't accept it. And if you go to the bed, that's mean you are asking for trouble. That's mean you are refusing order. And most of the time they all see you. They spray you with gas, with that pepper, pepper spray. For no reason, you're sitting there just waiting for them to come inside. But they won't. And they won't even accept your hands to be shackled. So they spray you in your face. And then they come with the shield so fast and they just mash you in your face and they push you down. And then the other guards, they pull you down, throw you on the floor, and they try to pin you down with your face again on the toilet. But now it's against my will. I cannot help it. What can I do? And then they tie you from the back, and they put your legs, and they push on against your, your, your back until they shackle you. And then they pick you up, and then they throw you outside on the floor, which is a very dirty floor, and they flip you back and forth, and they search you and all that. And they keep you in that bus in you for a while. It depends how much... They want to really put you under a lot of pain. Mm. After that, they, they put you with nothing. With nothing. You can be sleeping with nothing for days and days and days. And he, over what? Over a bag of salt. Or the stem from an apple. Or the stem from an apple. Which is amazing. That's why I want, the, I want somebody, when he hear the story, you're talking about a stem. Why not give them the stem from the apple to avoid that? Because, for first of all, because I felt that's what they want. They want me to submit to them. They want me to be broken. And that's why as soon as they leave the cell, I take the stem out of my mouth and show it to them. As much as they want me to be broken, as much as I want to show them, no, you're not going to break me. In one year, in 2012, more than 300 or 7, 370, 380 times in one year. And I, I'm talking about sometimes seven, eight times in one day. I think at one stage you did make friends with ants in your cell. You know, after the suicide, as they call it a suicide, the three brothers who got killed, they isolated me by myself on Camp Echo. For two years and ten months I was in my cell, never left my cell. Never seen the outside. Uh, and uh, I ended up making friends with all kinds of creatures. One of them is the ants, because they were beautiful, the way they were doing things and all that. I never knew that how much time I can spend with them, but I start watching them, I start learning the different ants, the different colors, the different way of doing things. And it was beautiful, because I learned so much, and they became so friendly with me, that I believe, I do believe that animals, insects, all kind of things, that they do realize us, they do know us, they knew me as sh sh me, because I used to feed them three times a day, put them the food, certain time, and they don't bother me. And, and that's, that's, that's one of the things that kept me going, you know, that I had, I had somebody to talk to, I had some people to watch, some, some insect to watch, to give me time to, you know. And there was a cat, too, oh, yeah, that you looked yeah, after. Yeah, that's Amira, princess. And there is a reason why I call her princess, because, you know, she doesn't just eat anything and she doesn't even go straight to the food. She go and smell it, you know, and go around and she look at you like, mm, you know, it's not like a big deal. You're not really doing something much for me. And that's why we call her Amira, princess, you know. And she actually, every time, Amira and the other cats, we have another cat, Susu, and we have so many of them. They keep hunting them. They keep trapping them and kill them because it brought so much joy to the brothers. We used to sacrifice so much because of them. A lot of brothers, they used to hide the food, hide the meat, the, the tuna, and we used to get punished. If you feed them, you get punished. So the brothers used to go through a lot from the early days and all that to feed them. And I think you fed some birds as well, didn't you? Oh yeah, all the time. Actually, the birds is a whole different story because it's a whole effort there, because I have to sit, collect the bread, 
and then you know I have to break it to small pieces then I have to mix it with some jam because they love sweet stuff I know from my young hood I used to have birds so they love the sweet stuff so I used to mix it with honey jam things like that and then I have to sneak it out sometimes these kind of examples you've given that that's is it fair to say that's bringing some purpose to your daily you have life? To. you have to especially for someone like me who's been isolated all the times I have to find something someone to talk to to play with and I used to do that with the animals with birds and all that you referred to the deaths of three detainees you said they took their own life you used they, speech they, marks that's what they that's what they said they but for me they commit a suicide or they've been killed it's all the blame to to the administration well, what do you know about what happened on that day I was isolated at that time and I was in my cell around 11 o'clock they came to me and they tied me to the feeding chair and that's when they start with the start with the torture they start beating my leg they start you know pinching me they start sticking their fingers in my eyes they start you know all the pressure points and all that and I'm screaming screaming and screaming next day I was just sleeping and suddenly I see them running to me and FCE me again and throw me another cell for a whole month I've been under a lot of pressure but why would three detainees take their lives at the same time on the same day honestly I cannot give you a short answer because there is a reason behind a lot of things happen there and I'll promise you again when the time is right, I will tell you the full story about these three, three brothers. You were cleared for release twice while you were inside Guantanamo Bay, once under President Bush in 2007, once under President Obama in 2009. How did you come to terms with the fact that you had been cleared for release, but it didn't subsequently happen? The first time when I got cleared, and they came to me to send me to Saudi Arabia I thought really it was my fault refusing to go back to Saudi Arabia and I felt like it doesn't matter if, if, if really I care for my wife and my kids I want to be with them I know I'm gonna sacrifice I have to sacrifice so I thought it's gonna be like a short time you know I thought maybe a few months and then they'll say hey this guy's not gonna walk guys Saudi Arabia just send him to Britain because I'm already cleared I mean but one year passed and then they came back again to me in 2009 and they told me you are leaving again yet I felt like this time I'm sure these guys they want me to go to Saudi Arabia and they have nothing to do with anything that I, I pose threat let me just tell them that I need to go back to my wife and my kids again I refused and again I felt like it's not gonna be long why because promise Obama promised to close this place so I thought you know, it's not going to be long before I'm going to be released. But you could have been free in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Your wife and children could have joined you there. That's the whole thing. I never believed that it's going to be easy for them to join. Especially that my wife waited for me all these years. So I felt obliged that I'm not going to go anywhere but to, uh, to my wife and my kids. In the 14 years you were there, did they break your spirit? break my spirit I can assure you no but did I get tired did I get sick of what I'm doing did I feel like I need to stop yes many times I felt like that's it did you think you would get out yes you... yes I had no doubt from day one I will be out because I have no doubt that I did not do anything wrong to deserve what happened and I know justice will prevail years after years after years justice will prevail it took 27 years with Nelson Mandela to get out and to be the president of his country. It took me only 14 years to prove to the world that I am the good person and they are the bad people. Will Guantanamo Bay ever close in your opinion? Yes. When? When the world knows the truth about it. When will that be? Very soon, hopefully. Isn't that what we're doing? Telling the truth about Guantanamo? telling the world that what happened in Guantanamo 12, 13 years ago is still happening at this time. It's still open because, like I told you, it's the way the story has to be told. People have to understand that Guantanamo did not change. It's just went through phases. And the more it goes, it's the more enhanced. 
the more they cover it up, the more they do their things secretly so nobody knows exactly what's happening. From, I will give you an example, from the flood, the light, flood light generators, which is a huge big machine running 24 seven, which is everybody can obviously see that they are doing it because of the noise, to a hidden noise, what they call the white noise. You will be sitting in your cell and you will hear that constant noise which drive you crazy. But actually the loud music, you didn't mind, did you? Sometimes, because they used to hate it when I listened to it, the, I used to sing with it. And what lyrics from White Snake gave you consolation in Guantanamo Bay? I used to sing it a lot. I used to, because the words, I thought the words it fits me. The words makes me feel like, yeah, it's me again. The, go, the words goes, here I go again on my own, going down the only road I never known. Like a drifter, I was born to walk alone. Because I know what it means to walk alone in only street of dreams. And here I go again. And it's true, because it's just dreams. Dreams that I will be home one day. Dreams that I will be free. Dreams that Guantanamo will be closed. And what do you say to those critics who even now, even now, say, you must have been a security risk. That's why the Americans kept you locked up for so long. I'm here. Everybody knows me now. Everybody sees me walking in the street. And I'm sure time will prove that I'm not a risk. How much do you think what happened to you and others at Guantanamo Bay is responsible for the growth of Islamist extremism? I'm sure there is a link, but, but we have to understand there is a reason why it happens. There is a reason, first of all, why these people came about, whoever is doing these acts. We have to understand there is a reason. And the great reason that we all agree on is injustice. So injustice breed all this anger. The anger breed all this horrible things that to happen after. Will part of your pursuit of justice be pursuing legal action against the British government? No. You're not going to take legal action against the British government? No, not at all. Why not? Because I don't believe that the court will solve this problem. I don't, the I don't believe the court will bring justice because of what happened in the past. And you're not interested in compensation? The compensation issue, really, I can't talk about it for many reasons, and that's why that's, an, uh, that's beside the points, that I do, wanna, I do not want to prosecute anybody. I don't want anybody to be you know, asked about what his role in the past. I just want people to tell the truth. Just I'm doing it right now. So we can really understand what happened and stop it from happening again. I need you to please let me tell the world the truth about Guantanamo. Let them know exactly what's happening because the world has, has the right to understand what's happening at this time. And I hope, I hope that I did something and I'm still going to carry on doing it until, for God, God will, I will close that place. I will do my best to close that place. And I, I'm willing to go to Guantanamo back again. If they need me to go back to help them to close that place, by Allah, I will go back. Thank you very much. You are welcome. You can watch the full interview on our programme page, bbc.co.uk forward slash Victoria. The Foreign Office says the UK government stands firmly against torture and cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment or punishment. We do not participate in, solicit, encourage or condone the use of torture or cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment for any purpose. Neither does the UK make use of any so-called enhanced interrogation, interrogation techniques. We have consistently made clear our absolute opposition to such behaviour and our determination to combat it wherever and whenever it occurs. The US Department of Defence say they do not tolerate the abuse of detainees and all credible allegations of abuse are thoroughly investigated and appropriate disciplinary action is taken. If those allegations are substantiated, we take such matters very seriously. All detainees at Guantanamo are treated humanely in a manner consistent with common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and all other applicable law.